So in this section, we'll talk about the myth behind the Yoga Sutra. In a way, it really isn't the myth behind the Yoga Sutra, the text. It's the myth behind the authorship of the Yoga Sutra. And what's important to know chronologically in terms of history is that this material arose after Patanjali had written his text in the late 4th, late 5th century. So the text exists, it's part of the dialogue of the yoga tradition. And as Hinduism's want is, it tends to produce stories around the material that it offers for us. It tends to delight in the production of tales of figures in history. And so history becomes mythology, history becomes legend. And that's no different in the case of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. So we have this figure with his name Patanjali. We don't know where his name comes from. Uh, he produces the Yoga Sutras in the late 5th century. And then stories rise up about who this guy might have been. Might have been. How did he become so intelligent? How, why was he so wise? And is often the case in many traditions, what happens is that we deify the figure. The figure becomes not a normal human being, but a god. And um, it's not so much here that Patanjali becomes a god, but he becomes a production of a god. And the story goes like this. So we have Vishnu, and Vishnu's hanging out. Vishnu is the sustainer god in the Hindu pantheon. We have what's called the Trimurti. We have the three major gods of the pantheon of India, and they are Brahma, Shiva, and Vishnu. And Vishnu is the sustainer god, Shiva is the destroyer god, and Brahma is the creator god. We won't go into that too much. But Vishnu's hanging out, and Vishnu is there because uh, he is, um, you know, the sustainer of the world, and he has a kind of relaxed position. He's a householder. He's not out there, you know, always whipping up fire and, brim fire and brimstone. He's not creating the world. The world is created, though there are creation myths with him. And he's definitely not interested in destroying the world. He's the sustainer god. And the myth of Vishnu has him lying back on a snake. And the snake has the name Ananta. And Ananta has, of course, a dual meaning in Sanskrit, as so many of these words do. And in this case, Ananta means infinite, but it also means a snake, a serpent. And it is said to be a thousand-headed serpent, and it's the couch of Vishnu. It's the Vahana. It's his vehicle. It's what he lays back on, though he has other vehicles as well. And so Vishnu is laying on his couch, and he's actually watching the dance of Shiva. Shiva's dancing for him. Not the Raja, his dancing for him. And what is what is what strangely happens when Vishnu is watching this dance is that he gets heavier and heavier. And Ananta is kind of stressed out. You know? He doesn't understand what's going on and he actually after Shiva leaves and the the weight shifts a little bit, he asks him why uh, why'd you get so heavy, you know? And um, he replies that the dance of Shiva is something profound and something real. And it pulls in kind of the opposite side of our experience of life. Kind of a strange thing. The guru has that role in the tradition. The guru, guru means dark light or it means heavy. And it, what it's suggesting there is the guru shows you the side of your personality that you are unfamiliar with, the side that you dread, the side that is not comfortable, but that you must face in order to become whole. So there's that kind of meaning around it. So anyway, responding to his curiosity, Vishnu tells him that Shiva is the Lord of Yoga and that he needs an agent to go down to earth to refresh the tradition because it is in a backward state. It needs to be, uh, it needs a resurgent. It, it needs new support. So, uh, Sesha volunteers for the role. And um, then we get a birth story of Patanjali. And in this birth story, um, chronologically speaking, it happens much later. Um, Patanjali, as I said, late fifth century, but these first stories about him arise eh, also actually near that time, but they don't really uh, come together until the 12th century. And then they actually don't get fully threaded together until as late as the 18th century. So this is really late material. 
Um, and it's kind of conflated with these other Patanjali's. There's a couple of the Patanjali's. There's one who wrote a commentary on the Charaka Samhita, which is an Ayurvedic text. Uh, that's actually in about the 12th century. And then there's a um, commentary on the, um, the um, grammarian Panini's work. So there's a grammarian Patanjali, and there is as well a, an Ayurvedic physician Patanjali. The grammarian text was written in the 2nd century, so arguably it could have been the, our real Patanjali, but most scholars agree that it wasn't. So we've got three different Patanjalis. But all these Patanjali stories kind of come together in the tradition, as, the, as we often see in the Indian traditions. And they get conflated into one human being, and they have this one creation story. And it goes back to this first part I told you where it's happening in the heavenly realm, but then it comes down to Earth. And when it comes down to Earth, it comes down through this kind of vision that Seisha has, he wants to have a worthy mother. And he sees this woman, Gunika. And Gunika, we'll keep walking, Gunika is a tapasvin. She is a, a tapasvini, I should say. She's a yogini, a tapasvini. She is a woman on the yogic path. So she's, she's a pure woman. She has practiced, she has purified herself, and she is worthy of the motherhood of Seisha. So he sees this woman, <laughs> it's kind of a funny story, and um, it, it, this is another thing about the Indian tradition is that they play with names, they play with what we call etiologies, um, which are creative etymologies. They take a word, and we see this in many old traditions, and from the word they evolve a story. So that's exactly what happens in this case. We have the name Patanjali, and Anjali has a number of meanings, but it's a reference to the way we hold the hands together in yoga, and many of you know this. That we have the space between the hands, and Anjali means space. It is the space between the hands that we hold when we do Anjali Mudra. And Pat means to fall, or Pat means Lord. And that will come in later in Patanjali's name. But in this part of the story, Pat Anjali means falling into Anjali, falling into space. He falls through space, down to the earth, and then Gonika is praying, and she's praying for a son. And she puts a bit of water in her, between her palms to pray to Vishnu. And when she opens her palm after saying her prayer, there's a little snake guy <laughs> between her hands. And the snake guy, of course, is Ananta. He's come down, he's chosen Gunika, he's going to be, uh, you know, in a human form through her. And, you know, she freaks out and she drops him. And he springs up from the ground as a human child. So, here the tradition is playing, it's redoubling the play with his name. Pat means to fall. He has fallen into Anjali, the, the hands that Ganika is holding. But then she has also dropped him from her hands. So she fell from his hands. Fell into the hands, fell from the hands. Pat Anjali. And fell into space, fell from her hand into space. Fell from Anjali, holding Anjali to the ground. So, we've got Patanjali, he is now uh, on earth and manifested, and um, we have this name falling into space, falling from space into space, into the hands of Anjali, from her hand into the ground. But then, when we come to uh, Yoga Sutras 247, there's also Ananta Samapati Byam. There's this phrase in the Yoga Sutras that refers to the nature of yoga and how Yoga is there to, um, to lead us to meditate on space, or meditate on the serpent, Ananta. So here the story kind of gets another turn and turns us back towards this potential idea of, of Patanjali's identity. At that point we get another creative ideology on his name, Patanjali Pat, and let's just look at this for a moment. We have a little snake here on the ground, <laughs> my photographer can get that. We'll call that auspicious. <laughs> so Patanjali... It might be a rattle. Yeah, he might be a little rattler. The way he, I don't know. Yeah, look at him. I think he's got a little rattle. That's a little rattler. Is it? I think he is. He kind of... Mm -hmm. Look at his tail. Let's keep moving. Yeah, let's keep if moving. see his uh, <laughs> So it is not a natural history discussion. See you, Patanjali. <laughs> <laughs> You put in a little appearance for us. So, um, so at that point we get a different 
creative ideology for his name. Pat Anjali, Pat means Lord, Anjali means space. The Lord of yoga is the Lord of space. And of course the meaning there is that is so much in the relationship, the conflation between space and consciousness. A lord of the art of yoga, Patanjali, who has written such important text, is of course also a lord of consciousness. He's also a lord of space. He's a lord, he's a lord of the realm of consciousness. Got the sky behind me. The open space of pure consciousness in which all of this, all of nature, all of prakriti, the movement of nature, kurt means action, prakriti, the primary movement of nature, and Purusha, which is also, of course, a part of the philosophy behind the Yoga Sutras, which represents space, is behind that whole creative ideology of his name because we move from Prakriti to Purusha. We move from this crowded, crowded space of relativity, of nature, of creation, into the open realm of consciousness which is identified with space itself, the self-reflective consciousness of the state of the mind. Um, so that's kind of it, guys. That's our little sketch of the legends behind the identity of Patanjali. It isn't about the text, it's about the author. And of course, we see that just kind of in the nature of the yoga tradition. Um, it very much anthropomorphizes things. It likes to dwell on human identities and human personalities, and in this case, it's no different. Um, see you in the next segment. Eric Shaw, signing off.